Welcome in to Outkick the Show, boys and girls. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis, the newly shorn, new haircut here, leaving for London on Saturday evening. Needed to get a new British haircut, needed to be ready to roll, ready to celebrate my winning the crown on Lock It In this week. I'm feeling good about the college football picks. I'm feeling good about my Thursday night football pick in the NFL with the Eagles going on the road against the Giants. We will dive into that pick here momentarily, but first I want to tell you where you can go to make sure that you get the best number anywhere on the web or anywhere in Vegas. Go look at all of the numbers. Go to sportsbookreview.com. Every book has different numbers. Make sure you get the right one and you will be on your way to winning the best possible uh, bets that you can. Get the right number and you can triumph. That's sportsbookreview.com. Also, my guy Ryan Kelly, wherever you may find yourself across the country, you need to get hooked up now. You need to make sure that you do get hooked up and you need to go to thehomeloanexpert.com. He can wipe out all your credit card debt. He can wipe out all of your student loan debt and he can put you with a great mortgage and uh, it'll be the best possible deal you can get. Replace bad debt with good debt. TheHomeLoanExpert.com Tell them Clay Travis sent you and you get an autographed copy of my book which lots of you are buying all over the country. Republicans buy sneakers too. I appreciate all of you who have already bought a copy. All right, let's dive right into it. Um, I think, I think tonight's game is going to be incredibly high scoring. I think tonight's game is going to be incredibly high scoring and so I have the over in tonight's Eagles-Giants game. I think we saw the uh, offense of the Giants last week against or on Sunday against the Panthers coming out of its shell. I think that they are going to have a lot of success against the Eagles. I think the Giants may well win this game but I think certainly the points are going to roll 44 is far too low and I am telling you right now you need to be on the over in this game. Get rich kids. Get on the over. Thursday night football on Fox. You will be great and happy if you have the over in this game. All right. Kanye West was in the Oval Office today with Donald Trump. And what I have found fascinating about Kanye West is how the moment he stepped outside of the acceptable realm of celebrity opinion which is that Donald Trump is the most awful human being who has ever lived what you have seen is that freedom of thought is not in any way allowed in modern day America for celebrities who happen to step outside of the realm of quote unquote acceptable opinion. Kanye West is an opinionated guy. He has, uh, I think, smartly started to pay attention to a lot of the arguments being espoused by Candace Owen. And what Candace Owen is doing, I believe, with Turning Point USA is she is blowing up one of the great flaws that exists in our country today which is the concept of identity politics. That is the idea that I can tell how you are going to vote by simply looking at your race and your gender And to me, the 2016 presidential campaign is, I believe, a function of ultimately the identity politics election. Everything that Hillary Clinton did in 2016 was predicated on getting elected to to the presidency by trying to bring together these coalition of people that she was slicing and dicing up based on their race, their gender, their religion, based on their uh, sexuality. All of these concepts were designed to divide Americans and make us believe that if I am gay, I have to vote this way. If I'm Hispanic, I have to vote this way. If I'm a college-educated white man, I have to vote this way. If I'm a woman, I have to vote this way. And the result, I think, was a campaign that ultimately came down to what a few people decided to do in... Uh, in a area um, of the Midwest. Michigan, 
Pennsylvania, uh, Ohio, and Wisconsin decided this election. Effectively, the Big Ten decided the campaign. And Donald Trump was able to appeal to enough of those people to win the election and that was where the election was decided. But even Donald Trump had to, in some way, run an identity-based campaign. I think what Kanye West is doing right now and what people like Candace Owens are doing is terrorizing the Democratic Party. Because if the Democrats ever only got around 70% of the black vote, their party as it exists right now would not work. They would never be able to win another election. The only race that is uniformly committed to any one party is the black race. And I have long argued that it makes no sense for one race to throw itself wholeheartedly behind one political party because what they ultimately do is take you for granted and sell you a list of grievances to make you believe that America is awful. And that's what I believe the Democratic Party does. And so I think in an ideal world we would live in an era and live in a country where when you see someone you have no idea how they might vote for president. If somebody sees me they have no idea what I might be voting for for president, right? They don't know if I'm voting Democrat. They don't know if I'm voting Republican. They don't have any idea. And that's when we truly have a battle of ideas as opposed to a battle of identities. Uh, And I think identity politics is the great cancer that afflicts our nation right now. I think social media has exacerbated that tension. And so Kanye West, I think what Donald Trump is trying to do, I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I think what Kanye West represents for Donald Trump and Jim Brown represented as well for the sports connection here is that he wants to reach out to people across the entire political spectrum and break up the dogma of identity politics. Now, let me say this. I don't think that Donald Trump is in any way a traditional Republican. I don't think that Donald Trump is a white supremacist or anything else. I think that Donald Trump is an intuitive politician who takes his read off of what his crowds respond to and gives them back what he hears as the biggest and best roars at his campaign events. That's why I think he loves to get outside the White House and go to all these small towns all over America, produce massive crowds, and try out almost extemporaneously his arguments on the American public and judge by how his crowd responds to his comments what they like. It's almost like a, uh, a stand-up artist who is on the stage working on working out their routine in real time, they figure out by hearing the crowd respond what lines work, what lines do not work, what lines need to be tweaked. And I've always kind of thought of Donald Trump as everything he does is rough draft, right? And people get upset because he gets up and he doesn't have prepared remarks, but he intuits based on the response of the crowd what his base is going to respond to. And so a lot of politicians decide this is what I believe and I'm going to go out and I'm going to sell it to them. Donald Trump responds to what the crowd gives back to him in terms of energy. And I think intuitively reaching out to Kanye is pretty smart. Now, what I have seen be said about Kanye West is infinitely worse than what Donald Trump has ever said about any minority in his political career. Remember how everybody in the media went after Donald Trump when he uh, attacked LeBron James and Don Lemon for their attacks on him. And everybody was like, oh, it's so racist of Donald Trump to attack LeBron James and Don Lemon to black men. But Don Lemon had on speakers on his show on CNN who said that Kanye West was a token Negro And they also said that Kanye West was dumb. So why is it okay for Don Lemon to broadcast the idea that the only reason Kanye West matters is because he's a token Negro and also to ridicule his intelligence, which is far worse than anything Donald Trump ever said about Don Lemon or LeBron James. And no one in the media lines up in any way 
to defend Kanye West. It's really pretty fascinating in many respects. Also, on Saturday Night Live, they came out and said, look, Kanye West is a great musician, but we don't care about his political opinions, just like I don't care if Joey Chestnut care, can eat a uh, hot dog uh, and, and tells me anything else about hot dog eating. I don't care about his talent. That's the exact same thing that Laura Ingram said about LeBron James and everybody lost their mind when she told LeBron James to shut up and dribble. So Saturday Night Live is saying the same thing to Kanye West. And by the way, Laura Ingram was criticized and people said, oh, it's racist of her to say this. Saturday Night Live is saying the same thing about Kanye West that Laura Ingram said about LeBron. And so what I think is fascinating about this in so many respects is that what we have established in this country right now is that there is a standard of acceptable speech. And my book is big about this. My book, which you need to check out if you haven't read it, I wrote about this a ton. There is a standard of acceptable speech in this country. And this is what I find incredibly troubling is that there's a difference between somebody saying, you know what, Clay Travis, I disagree with that opinion you just shared. And somebody saying, I, I, and somebody saying, you don't have the right to have that opinion. Okay? There's a difference between somebody combating my opinions. You can hear all of my opinions all day long, 15 hours on the radio, two and a half hours on Outkick the Show, five hours on television. 22 and a half hours of live opinions every single week plus all that I write. There are tons of opinions that I give in any given week. You don't have to respond to them in any way and agree with them. You can attack my opinion. You can uh, throw out, you can say this is a ridiculous assertion. You can come up with arguments against my opinions. Now most of the time I would be better attacking my own opinions than the average person would be because by the time I share an opinion, I've already considered every counter opinion. Some people say, hey, when you take calls, you a lot of times on your show cut people off early. And the answer is yes because they're not very smart and they're not making a very interesting statement. I want callers to be interesting on my show if I already know what your argument is and I can already refute it as being boring or not very smart or not very intelligent, I'm going to wipe it out. Most of the time when I put out an opinion, in fact all of the time, I've already considered your counter arguments and rejected them. It doesn't mean that I'm right. It means that it's very rare that somebody comes up with an idea I haven't contemplated beforehand when I came up with my own idea. All right. So to me what Kanye represents is fertile mind. I am always more interested in a good question than I am an answer. And if you're reading what Candace Owens is putting out there, if you're seeing what she is, is, is advocating for, it's ultimately what I advocate for all the time, which is personal growth, personal responsibility, the idea that you can only rely on the hand at the end of your sleeve. And I think we're at a combustible moment in the country when social media has convinced so many people that the woke universe is stronger than it is, we're close to a combustible moment when everything's just going to explode. And identity politics, I think, my guy Dave Rubin has been talking about this, I think identity politics is close to giving up the ghost. Because when you have on CNN guys who are going on and feeling comfortable calling Kanye West a token Negro because he has quote-unquote an unacceptable opinion and when they feel comfortable calling him a dumb Negro because of his uh, opinions, we've reached an intriguing pressure point where Kanye West and others like him who have similar thoughts are starting to blow up the idea that we live in right now which is this artificially constructed identity politics laden era. And I don't know if Trump is going to be the one to blow it up. I kind of think that we're going to have an identity politics election in 2020 which is going to be, I believe, Donald Trump running against the most anti-Donald Trump person imaginable, which might well be Kamala Harris. They're going to run Donald Trump, a white guy, against probably a woman or probably a minority woman so that it can be an entire identity politics-laden election. I think the best thing that could happen for the country in 2020 
is if Donald Trump went head to head with somebody else like him. Another white guy who's over 70. I think we would get a great battle if we got Michael Bloomberg against Donald Trump. I think Joe Biden against Donald Trump would be a great race. I think ridiculously Bernie Sanders against Donald Trump would be a great race because it would take much of identity politics off the table and those guys would be combating for Midwestern voters who are going to decide the election and all the other people in swing states. I think unfortunately what we're likely to get is an identity politics laden election where you get the anti-Trump and the way that they determine the anti-Trump is not by ideas, not by arguments, but by everybody who is out there right now making the argument that what we need is not a white guy, right? So whatever you're going to end up with is the most anti-white guy possible. I'm not sure right now in this identity politics laden America that a white guy can get the nomination of the Democratic Party because there are so few actual white men that are being appealed to by the Democratic Party. Which, by the way, I think is crazy. I think what Trump represents in many ways is a fundamental recalculation of where the political parties lie because for a long time you had the Democratic Party representing the unions, representing the poor, uneducated, uh, vast majorities of the American population. And now Donald Trump, this rich Republican, is out there winning all of the union votes and lining up the entire Midwest. Here's the other thing I think is interesting about this, uh, this political lineup in general is I think that, again, Trump doesn't have traditional bona fides in the Republican Party. But let's just take away Trump. If I told you that the President of the United States was in charge, that the stock market was basically at record highs, uh, I know it's down the last couple of days. Dow guy, S&P 500 guy can, can read me the riot act about how it's down the last couple of days. I'm talking about in general. If I told you that per capita income was at an all-time high, if I told you that the black unemployment rate was at an all-time low, if I told you that the Hispanic unemployment rate was at an all-time low, if I told you that the United States unemployment rate in general was at an all-time low, if I told you that GDP was growing in excess of 4% a year, would you, and we were not really at war, I'm not counting Afghanistan or Iraq as legitimate war, and we haven't had a major terror attack, hopefully we'll continue, knock on wood, in like 20 years almost now, wouldn't you feel like this is the best possible time to ever be alive in America? I feel like people today are so angry when in reality, if you just sit back and look at all the external factors and spend less time on social media marinating in the latest outrage culture moment, there's actually never been a better time to be an American than right now. There's never been a better time to be alive in this country. There's never been a lower poverty rate. There's never been a higher per capita income. There's never been a better time for employment. So all of this sideshow, which I think Donald Trump certainly exacerbates because it fuels his reality show, uh, like the presidency as a reality show mindset. I think Donald Trump plays into that and I don't think it's to his best benefit all the time. I think if we just kind of focus on the underlying metrics of the economy, everything is going pretty fantastically. And I think ultimately what Trump is going to get the benefit of, and I've been making this argument for a little while, I think the impact of the Kavanaugh hearings, the great silent majority of America is going to substantially repudiate the decisions that were made by the Democrats. And there's going to be, at least in the Senate, a red wave. I'm looking at Real Clear Politics, most recent political trends on all their polls. Ted Cruz is up nine points. Heller is up in Nevada. Uh, the the, the Mc, McSally, I think, or whatever the name, McNally, whoever's running in, uh, in, uh, in Arizona, I believe, has started to create some space between uh, himself and, or herself and Kristen Sinema. Uh, Mar Marsha Blackburn in Tennessee is up like eight points. Heidi Heidelkamp is down double digits in North Dakota. I think Claire McCaskill is in trouble in Missouri. We'll see what the impact is of this hurricane on the Florida race but already there was starting to be movement in the direction of the governor uh, in Florida to replace Bill Nelson. 
I think we're starting to look at an era. Donnelly in Indiana is in trouble. I think we're starting to look at a, a, a Republican reaction in the Senate in particular. We'll have to wait on the House, I believe, because I think there's a decent chance the Democrats win the House. But in the Senate, I think the Republicans could pick up five or six seats. And I think this is going to be a huge mess for everyone. And I think the national media is going to have to take a step back and say, wait a minute, we're so cloistered in D.C., we're so cloistered in New York City, we're so cloistered in L.A. and San Francisco that we don't know what the vast majority of the country thought about the Kavanaugh hearings and people are rejecting and repudiating the behavior that they saw from the Democratic Senate Judiciary Committee members. And I think that's going to be the story in the Senate of the, uh, of the 2018 midterms. And I'm starting to see people pick up on this. I was the first person to make this argument that I heard and I started saying it almost immediately after the Kavanaugh hearing. I said, this is going to blow up in the Democrats' faces. And I'm starting to see other people start to pick up on it. But I am looking at, again, all the polling data that is coming out. Now, if you're a Democrat, what you have to hope is that a month is a long time and that people don't end up voting in a national way on their Senate races, that they forget about what happened with Kavanaugh over a month. But I already told you, I am choosing to vote for Marsha Blackburn as a message to send to the Senate Judiciary Committee Democrats that I believe they overreached substantially in the Kavanaugh hearing. And I don't agree with Kavanaugh about a lot of what he said. I don't agree with him on abortion, probably. I don't agree with him on the death penalty. I don't agree with him on, uh, on maybe gay marriage. Uh, but I believe the president deserves the right to nominate uh, people for the Supreme Court that fit his political persuasion. And I think Kavanaugh, as well as Gorsuch, were perfectly normal uh, selections for the Supreme Court, for a Republican president, whether it was Donald Trump or anyone else. So I am going to vote for Senate in my state for Marsha Blackburn because I believe the Senate Democrats overrate, overreach. Now, I'm voting for the Democrat for governor, but I was unclear how I was going to vote. And then the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings happened. And I can't, in good conscience, vote for a Democrat in the wake of what I think was one of the worst, ex worst things I've seen in my life from elected officials. I thought quizzing him on his yearbook, believing somebody because she's a woman, not because of the evidence that was in, in, in ac actual out there. There was no corroborating evidence to support her claim. I thought it was one of the worst moments in my life as a voter. And I believe it was a modern-day McCarthy moment for a lot of people out there. So I was un unclear how I was going to vote. My election in Tennessee, Senate race going to be close. Marsha Blackburn's opened up an eight-point lead. I think she's going to run away with it. Phil Bredesen tried to come out and say, you know what, I am voting for Kavanaugh too. He waited till he knew he was going to get confirmed. And then he said that. I don't believe him. I like Phil Bredesen. I think he was a great mayor. I think he was a great governor. I don't believe him when he says that if he were in the Senate, he would have voted for Brett Kavanaugh's nomination. I do not believe him. There's the video out now. Uh, I haven't shared that video because, frankly, from Project Veritas, they're talking to low-level campaign aides. And I don't think low-level campaign aides have any idea what Phil Bredesen would actually do. Those are like 23- and 24-year-old kids. May get fired from that campaign. I actually feel bad for them. I have been a 23- or 24-year-old kid working on a campaign who talks a big game, but in reality, you don't have any idea what the people who are a lot more powerful and higher up than you think about a particular issue, and they didn't know they were being taped. But my contention is that their opinion was correct, which is that Phil Bredesen is saying he's going to vote for Brett Kavanaugh while actually he wouldn't do it, and so he's trying to appeal to be a moderate voter to Republicans and he's actually not going to do it. All right, I don't know if you guys have seen it. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Uh, but my interview, I should say listen to it, my interview with the Tiger Hunter was one of the greatest things that's happened in sports radio history. I tweeted out the link. If you were watching this show right now and you did not go listen to my Tiger Hunter interview, we had the guy who is trying to catch, either catch or kill, a... Tiger that has killed 14 people in India. We had him live from India. It was unbelievable. It was unbelievable how good that interview was. And it wasn't because of me. I asked good questions, but answers make interviews typically not questions. 
and his answers were phenomenal. We're going to play it again tomorrow in Hour 2, at the start of Hour 2, if you didn't hear it. By the way, if you don't know, I host a daily morning sports talk radio show, 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. You can get up early tomorrow. You can hear it. It'll be good. Joel Klatt will be on with us. Jason Whitlock again. It's a good show. All right, good show. We're going to replay that interview at the top of uh, Hour 2. And the feedback on it has been phenomenal. In fact, I've only gotten one negative comment. Just one negative comment at all. And I think I should read it because I think you guys will enjoy it. Uh, A guy by the name of Peter Schubert. Peter Schubert wrote, Tigers are endangered, asshole. I know you're a rich Republican, all right? uh, And you think you've got it all figured out. But you're just a rich piece of crap. Celebrating the killing of endangered species couldn't go any lower. Changing morning stations. Just die, motherfucker. Uh, Peter. Uh, So that was Peter Schubert not happy with me. I would just, let me just put this out here right here. If somebody killed 14 humans and you decided that that person who had killed 14 humans should be either caught or killed and it was a human, wouldn't that be reasonable? If you had a serial killer loose who had killed 14 humans, wouldn't you think it was reasonable for a police officer to either arrest or kill that person? I don't know about you, but I think I would come down on that side. I think I'd be like, you know what? I'm okay with the serial killer getting shot. Might uh, might rather him get taken into uh, being taken hostage. Once a tiger kills 14 people, and if you listen to the interview, what you learn is that a tiger that has killed 14 people is also a tiger that has developed taste for human flesh and so will continue to eat. And if you listen to the interview, it's actually a tigress and she has two tiger cubs that have also developed a taste for human flesh. Probably a good idea to get them taken out before they kill more humans. Uh, The Pac-12 has screwed up. I'll get into that a little bit tomorrow, but it ties up with with a larger story. Uh, And I think it's a good story. The Pac-12 needs to look into their instant replay review, and I think every conference does. Because the standard that needs to be applied should be consistent. I still don't think all the time we get consistently good rulings out of instant replay officials. If you haven't read that story, Yahoo Sports had a report that everything uh, was not fantastic there. So, uh, So I would encourage you to pay attention to that. Larry Scott came out and admitted that they had screwed up on their Pac-12 uh, instant replay crew. That is a uh, that is a story worth paying attention to. Finally, Khabib has threatened to leave the UFC if the UFC takes actions against one of his teammates who climbed into the ring and took a swing at uh, Conor McGregor. Uh, the UFC, I'm convinced now, the drama coming out of the Khabib-McGregor fight is the best thing that could have ever happened to the UFC. My, my position in general, all publicity is good publicity for individuals like me, as long as we don't face jail time. So, so far, I've never faced jail time for any of the publicity that I've gotten. I don't think any of the UFC people are going to face jail time. I think it would be incredible if this story continues for the UFC. I don't think the Khabib McGregor Part 2 would be even very entertaining fight because based on what I saw when I watched that fight last weekend, there's no way McGregor is ever going to win a fight against Khabib. Khabib is better than he is. He's more skilled. He's more tactically sound. Moreover, it's not a very entertaining fight. They go to the ground and then they grapple for like three or four minutes. So I am telling you right now that I love everything that's coming out of the, uh, of the mess surrounding the UFC. And, uh, and so that is the story. My, my praise for you, my plea for you, Please go listen to that Tiger Hunter interview if you want 15 minutes of great scintillating entertainment and tell me it wasn't incredible. We're going to play it for you again in hour two. I will be on Lock It In, gambling picks for Thursday night, college football gambling picks. My guy, Cousin Sal, my guy, Todd Furman, my girl, Rachel Bonetta, will be on at 4.30 Eastern, 3.30 Central, 2.30 Mountain, 1.30 Pacific. Set your DVRs and come and hang out with us. My name is Clay Travis. DBAP, boys and girls, unless sometimes it makes sense, you need to SBAP. Go listen to the Tiger interview. I love all of you. 
My name is Clay Travis. This has been Outkick. The show will be live tomorrow, 6 to 9. Watch me now on FS1. This has been Outkick. The show. See you guys tomorrow.